on World News Tonight. Russia strikes back. Vladimir Putin hits back at Ukraine after the latter's terror attacks on the Crimea Bridge. Visa free travel. The Far East Island lifts bans on visa free travels after almost a year. Oil cuts. Saudi Arabia cuts production of oil ahead of Joe Biden's midterm. And protecting tradition. National Hangar Museum traces part of Korean alphabet in an interactive exhibit. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. And we're starting off with more updates in the war in Ukraine. Now, Russia struck cities across Ukraine during rush hour, killing civilians and destroying infrastructure. Russian President Vladimir Putin called the strikes retaliation for an attack on the Kerch Bridge that links Russia to the annexed Crimean Peninsula. The Russian missile strikes that slammed into the Ukrainian capital during the Monday morning rush hour shattered the feeling of relative security that Kyiv has enjoyed since the last missile attack four months ago. Anger and hurt was clear among residents of Kyiv, where police say at least five people have been killed and 12 wounded. These are Russia's most widespread airstrikes since the start of the Ukraine war, raining cruise missiles on busy cities, knocking out power and heat, in apparent revenge for the explosion on the bridge connecting Russia to the annexed Crimean Peninsula. Russia charged Ukraine with responsibility for the blast, while a Ukrainian presidential aide blamed the incident on infighting between Russian security bodies. Explosions were also reported in at least six other cities around the country. Ukrainian officials said at least 10 people were killed and scores injured and swathes of the country left without power. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia timed its attacks to inflict the greatest possible losses, telling the public to remain in air raid shelters, while Kiev Mayor Vitaly Klitschko warned residents to expect further attacks. Websites for more than a dozen U.S. airports were temporarily brought offline due to cyber attacks by hackers based in Russia, with Russian-speaking hackers claiming responsibility for the disruption. Tonight, some of the nation's biggest airports are scrambling to protect their websites after a coordinated attack by hackers were operating inside Russia. The first so-called denial of service attack hitting LaGuardia Airport's website at 3 a.m. this morning. Then America's busiest, Atlanta's Hartsfield, LAX and O'Hare. More than a dozen airport websites hit with a denial of service attack, essentially jamming the websites with data. Airports have always been a target of interest for these adversaries. While no flights were affected, experts say the group claiming credit for the hits, known as KillNet, has stepped up cyber attacks on NATO allies since Russia's invasion of Ukraine began and claimed responsibility for taking down a U.S. Congress website in July and several state government websites last week. This is a type of actor that we are very worried about carrying out you know, a destructive attack, but uh, that's not the case here. Traveling to Japan can now be done visa-free. The resumption of visa-free travel comes two years and seven months after the country's borders were essentially shuttered to all travelers due to the fears about the spread of COVID-19. Starting Tuesday, Japan reopens its doors to visa-free travelers from dozens of countries, including South Korea, ending some of the world's strictest border controls imposed to slow the spread of COVID-19. From October 11th, we will lift the ceiling on the number of entrants into Japan, lift the ban on individual travel and lift the ban on visa list travel. The return for visa-free travel also comes amid some easing of quarantine measures in Japan. Those that have received their third COVID-19 vaccine shots will be exempt from having to take a PCR test before entry. However, Travelers that have only received two shots or are unvaccinated will need to submit a negative PCR test result taken 72 hours before boarding their flight. Also, by downloading the Japan-developed MySOS app and registering information such as a vaccination certificate in advance, entry to Japan becomes much smoother and more convenient. All this is great news for people who have been waiting to travel to Japan. 
And as airlines are gradually increasing the number of flights to Japan, sales by low-cost carriers, which carry the largest portion of travelers from South Korea to Japan, are likely to improve significantly as well. Iranian protesters remained defiant with students tagging sit-ins and some industrial workers going on strike despite a crackdown activists say that has left dozens dead and hundreds more imprisoned. Iran has been gripped by protests for over three weeks and they show no sign of abating. The movement has swept the country, largely being led by defiant women. At this university in the capital, Tehran, students are chanting poverty, corruption, injustice, death to this tyranny. And on Monday, there were signs that the unrest was seeping deeper into the fabric of society, with workers in Iran's vital oil industry joining in the movement, unafraid of the violent crackdown the government has been unleashing. Dozens of demonstrators are reported to have been killed, the deaths drawing international condemnation. But on Monday, Tehran remained unmoved. The internal issue of the Islamic Republic of Iran is related to the government and the nation of Iran. We will not allow any country to interfere in the internal affairs of Iran. The protest started following the death of 22-year-old Iranian Kurd Masa Amini whilst in the custody of the Iranian morality police. Late last week, the government said she had died following an illness, but Masa's family and the protesters aren't buying it. They claim she was beaten, and the reports of violence towards other young women have multiplied since her death. On Monday, the UK slapped sanctions on the morality police in its entirety, following similar moves from the US and Canada in recent weeks. Gas prices are on the rise after Saudi Arabia and other countries have announced a big cut in oil production. This was a major blow on consumers as well as US President Joe Biden since the midterm elections are nearing. The Saudi announcement a blow to American consumers and a gut punch to President Biden, despite his fist bump summit with the Saudi crown prince, when the administration thought they could get a deal to keep production up and prices low before the midterms. I was able to bring gasoline down well over $1.60, but it's, it's inching up because of what the Russians and, and the Saudis just did. Now even Democrats blasting that Riyadh summit and calling for the U.S. to withdraw troops from Saudi Arabia. I would... Um, reconsider why we um, provide for the security of a country that seems to have no concern for the security of ours and our allies. That's because raising oil prices produces more oil profits for Vladimir Putin's war machine. The White House now scrambling to bring prices down. One option, release more oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but it's dangerously low. The president has already released more than 200 million barrels this year. Another possibility, lift sanctions on Venezuela so it can pump more oil. But that country's strongman, Nicolas Maduro, has still not delivered on democratic reforms or pressure U.S. oil companies to keep prices down. Is any of this going to work? They've sort of run out of bullets. U.S. producers won't. Uh, listen to them. The Saudis won't listen to them again. It really is, at its core, a supply issue. He has to find somebody who's going to pump more. And nobody's nobody wants to do that right now. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, amid a rising death toll, rescuers in Las Tejerias, Venezuela, searched for more than 50 missing persons after devastating floods, while tropical storm Julia killed at least 16 people in Central America. At least 25 people died and some 50 people are missing in Venezuela due to floods and landslides caused by extreme rain over the weekend. The downpour flooded five small rivers and swept large debris from surrounding mountains into the town of Las Tajerias, 40 miles or 67 kilometers southwest of Caracas, damaging businesses and farmland. Vice President Delcy Rodriguez said a month's worth of rain had fallen in just eight hours and that pumps used to power the community's drinking water system were carried away in the floodwaters. Many people are feared to be trapped under the mud and rocks, including the brother of resident Scarlett Jalindez. We need help. 
Please help rescue people because we do not know if people are buried. I have a missing brother. We need support. It is not only my pain. It is the pain of all the people who are here. President Nicolas Maduro said in a tweet that he had designated the area a disaster zone and had declared three days of mourning. And in Nicaragua, Tropical Storm Julia made landfall on the country's Caribbean coast over the weekend, forcing more than 13,000 families to evacuate and leaving one million people without power. Julia on Monday moved along the coast of El Salvador toward Guatemala, with Salvadorian authorities reporting at least nine deaths, including five soldiers. At least five more died in Honduras. The National Hurricane Center said heavy rains could cause life-threatening flash floods and mudslides across Central America as the storm weakens. The United Nations and the Red Cross has warned of heat waves that will become so extreme in certain regions of the world within decades that human life there will be unsustainable. Climate change means the Earth is only getting hotter. And according to the UN and the Red Cross, the consequences are now life-threatening. A joint report published Monday says heat waves will within decades become so extreme in parts of Africa and Asia that human life there will be unsustainable. Devastating droughts like the one pushing Somalia to the brink of famine are made far deadlier when they combine with extreme heat. We can expect more of these in the future. Indeed, things are only going to get far worse as climate change continues to spiral out of control. Because in heat waves, it is this most vulnerable and marginalized people who will suffer, people already suffering from conflict, hunger, poverty. The organization said that between 2010 and 2019, 38 heat waves claimed the lives of over 70,000 people. They also predicted future death rates from heat disasters would be as high as those from cancer or infectious disease. Both bodies now urge countries to take aggressive steps that could alleviate the worst effects of heat disasters, including providing early warning systems to people and authorities, training for local level responses, and investing in the most at-risk regions to help them cope. Wealthier countries have the resources to help their people adapt and have made promises to do so. Poorer countries who are not responsible for these torture, torturous heat waves, do not have those resources. The report was released ahead of next month's COP27 climate change summit in Egypt, where it's expected 2022's climate disasters will be hot on the agenda. Renault and Nissan said that they were in talks about the future of their alliance, including the Japanese automaker, considering investing in a new electric vehicle venture by its French partner. Renault and Nissan said Monday they were in talks about radically reshaping their alliance. The negotiations could prompt the biggest reset since the 2018 arrest of longtime chief Carlos Ghosn. One option is for Renault to sell some of its Nissan stake. The French dominance of the alliance has long been a sore point for the Japanese side. Renault owns 43% of the Japanese firm, which in turn owns a 15% stake in its French partner. Now Renault wants Nissan to invest in its new EV venture, which is being set up separately from its legacy combustion engine unit. One source says Renault is under pressure to cut its stake in Nissan in return. The two firms refused to comment on the talks, besides saying that they were engaged in trustful discussions over structural improvements. At the start of this year, the pair set out plans to invest $26 billion over five years in electric car development. Renault shares were up around 4% by Monday afternoon following the reports. The Revolution for Prosperity, a party formed by a diamond magnate in March, has won the most seats in Lesotho's election. But the party will need to court others to gain a majority in parliament. It was only formed earlier this year. But the Revolution for Prosperity has emerged as Lesotho's biggest single party following an election last week. That announcement was made by the Southern African Kingdom's Election Commission on Monday. However, it also said that the party, created by diamond magnate Sam Matakane in March, has fallen short of a clear majority. 
With 56 seats, RFP will now have to court other parties to pave the way for a change of government in Lesotho's 120-seat parliament. Lesotho, a landlocked enclave within South Africa, has been marred by years of political instability under the current governing party, the All Basotho Convention. Friday's election went ahead despite a deadlock in Parliament on a range of constitutional reforms aimed at bringing order to Lesotho's fractious politics, and which were meant to be enacted before the vote. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Amazon said that it will invest close to $1 billion over the next five years in electric vans, trucks and low-emission package hubs across Europe, accelerating its drive to achieve net-zero carbon. Lebanon and Israel have received a final draft of a US-mediated maritime border deal that satisfies all their requirements and could imminently lead to a historic deal. British Finance Minister Kwasi Kwarteng under pressure to rebuild shattered invested confidence in the new government's economic agenda brought forward the publication date for the fiscal plans and economic forecasts. US stocks fell with the tech-heavy Nasdaq posting its lowest close in more than two years as investors continue to worry about the pace of the central bank tightening and its impact on the economy. At least one person died during clashes with police in Haiti as citizens' frustration at the government mounts. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you with visuals of Hangul Day, a day to celebrate the creation of the Korean alphabet. Stay safe and have a good night.